So hi everyone, how is it going so far? All good? Yes, good? Fantastic. So I want to tell you a story at the beginning. So in 2018, I delivered my first talk on microphone dance. And uh, it was in Dublin. Um, I tried to gather uh, three years on, in the trenches, designing and building a distributed interface uh, using uh, what today we call microphone dance. Back in the days, they didn't have a name. Um, and it was working on web and uh, living room devices, so set the boxes, console, whatever. So quite a lot of constraints there. I have tens of uh, uh, dozens of developers on the front end only working on that. And it was, it was a real challenge, because obviously on the front end, the only way to do so back in the days was discipline and the knowledge of design pattern across all the developers. So what I did is starting with uh, the idea of, OK, what he is a distributed system. Let's try to gather some, some principles, and that's how I started, basically. Since then, a lot of things have changed. A lot of companies started to embrace this idea of, of distributed uh, front-end. And, um, and, and they started to learn what was doable and how to do that, how to implement what was wrong. And, uh, and, a lot, and they started to share this information with, uh, with the community. That is absolutely great, in my opinion. Obviously, a uh, few things change also for me personally. I joined AWS in 2021, and uh, uh, this is one of my favorite sentences that the, uh, our CEO is, uh, is used to say. Um, and I, I started to consult for, for dozens of, of companies worldwide, from New Zealand to, to Silicon Valley. Uh, and I started to, to see regular patterns, or better, anti-patterns. Uh, and, uh, and for me, it was important to, to try to map them and trying to collect them and understand what is really working, what are the common mistakes uh, that I have seen over and over again uh, from companies and, and teams that were approaching microphone tents, uh, but they were making always the common mistakes. That's the reason of this talk. So I spoke a lot in the last few years about the benefits of microphone tents, but now I want to show you the other side of the coin and trying to mitigate that, possibly. My name is Luca. I'm a, a principal serverless specialist. Um, I'm based in London, uh, and uh, I work for AWS. I'm an international speaker and a book author. So let's start first with the benefits. It's the only slide where I show benefits, OK? So <laughs> don't worry about that. Then I will show the dark side. Um, the first one, uh, why microphone tents are useful, because they allow you to have incremental upgrades. Uh, I think is. Uh, extremely important nowadays that uh, in large systems, because of, just to uh, do a big spoiler, microphone tents are not viable for every system. So if your single page application and uh, server-side rendering one are absolutely fine architecture, but if you have a large system with large teams or a company that has to scale, uh, the possibility to have incremental upgrade is absolutely great. And the fact that microphone tents are independent units would allow you to, to do that and slowly but steadily uh, remove your monolithic architecture into a distributed one using microphone tents in this case. The second benefit is decentralization. And that, I would say, is more a mindset and cultural shift than a technical one. Very often, we are used to have um, the technical leadership that uh, uh, takes uh, ownership of defining what goods looks like. Uh, they take decisions like frameworks, programming languages, and uh, um, sometimes design patterns and other things. There is nothing wrong with that. But if we work in a distributed system, we need to empower developers and teams. They are the business experts. They are the ones that are closer to the action. They, can, they are in the best position to, taking, uh, to, to take a decision. So what the tech leadership should do now is uh, uh, facilitating and enabling them. What we call uh, the uh, in the great talk from, from uh, Suzanne about uh, uh, team topologies, uh, DDD, and world lame up, uh, we talk about in team topologies um, about the platform teams or the enabler, uh, enabler teams. And this is what they expect from a tech leadership nowadays in distributed system. But we need to have developers that are uh, empowered to take decisions inside certain guardrails. We also want to have a cognitive load reduction. In team topologies, they explain very well this part, but think uh, in a very pragmatic way. 
when you have a, a team that is working on monolithic code base, and, I, and this code base basically uh, may, maybe is like uh, three years old, five years old, and there is uh, a bunch of new people joining uh, the company, then they need to understand end-to-end -end the design pattern that you apply, what is the state management that you use, what is the UI framework that you use, why you use Moment.js over another library, and so on and so forth. There is a lot that they need to learn. Usually, if you work with distributed system, your complexity for understanding the business area that you are uh, supposed to, to manage uh, is reduced drastically. I've seen teams that, uh, new team, brand new teams, that when they started to uh, pair with the uh, product managers uh, and starting to understand what is the business that they need to work, in a couple of sprints, they, w they started to have their uh, code in production. And that's exactly what we want to have. The other thing is, when we talk about distributed system, I often say that are not meant only for technologies, are meant mainly for organizations. Because what we are trying to scale is the organization. For your final user, they don't care if it's a monolithic architecture or is a distributed system. What they care is that they have the features that they are looking like, the, that they are looking for, and they, uh, they want to have like, the service that, that, you, that you sell. So enough with the benefit. Let's start with the anti-pattern. And let's start with the first one or what I call the yin and the yang, the difference between micro frontends and components. That is by far the most misunderstood concept uh, when we talk about micro frontends. I'll give you an example. So let's take a component. Most common one, the button. A button in a design system usually has a label, fantastic label. And then uh, suddenly, um, in one specific area of the application, we want to have the possibility not only to have a label, but also an icon. Fantastic. So then uh, this button started to get popularity inside the company. So now you have also the capability to change the border color, because we need in multiple portals. We want also to have a, a different rollover animation. And then you introduce uh, um, localization, so you want to have these uh, auto size uh, of the button based on the language that, that you put in. And last but not least, uh, you want to have the possibility to disable by default the button. So as you can see, this button start, uh, starts to have quite a lot of features and capabilities. But what is the key differentiator between a component and a microphone tens? The answer lies inside the definition of microphone tens. They, as you can see here, they are a technical representation of business subdomain. If you're familiar with domain-driven design, prob probably you know what I'm talking about. They are independent implementation with same or different technology choice. Uh, they minimize the code share, and they're owned by a single team. Now, about all these things that I highlighted, only two are the things that we care about. Key differentiator is that microphone tents are looking to the problem from the business perspective. And the button is not business mothers. It's completely different. Second thing is independent implementation. Now, if you think about a component, the reality is we have all these properties. We have all these capabilities with the component. But who is owning the domain? The container. The container instructs how the component should be managed. I want, I want it disabled. I want it with the red color on my border, and so on and so forth. A microphone tense doesn't work in that way. A microphone tense is self-contained. Otherwise, it couldn't be independent. So when we look at the microphone tent, few characteristics, has to be independent. I have, I, I, as a team, I want to be able to deploy that in production without any coordination. I need to optimize for speed in this case. And therefore, it's essential that when we see ourselves that we think we are doing microphone tents and we are instead deploying and coordinating with multiple teams, asking ourselves, what are we designing here? Microphone tents are domain aware, so they have some boundaries, like when we talk about bounded context, uh, where you leave your logic inside there, and that's also why it's independent. Usually, you define input and output. It's something that we are very used in uh, uh, the microservice world uh, using, uh, I don't know, API first design, for instance, one of the techniques that uh, comes to my mind. So you define what are the input and output, and we will discuss uh, later on more about that. Uh, and, and that is the way how you are communicating inside the ecosystem. And last but not least, are less extensible. So if you think about a button, you can be the same button that is inside the header, inside the footer, inside the menu, wherever. 
In, in micro intents, usually because is domain aware, the extensibility is reduced. So when you find yourself in something like that, you are probably dealing with distributed components, not micro frontends. So ask yourself, what are you optimizing for and what you are designing? Is it micro frontends or are components? The second anti-pattern is called the Hydra of Learner, or uh, the multi-framework approach. That is the second um, thing that I have heard so many times, uh, and I read so many blog posts around, uh, that is uh, fascinating. So often I, I read, oh yes, I started to do micro front ends because finally my developers have the freedom to pick wherever UI framework they want, wherever uh, library they want, and they can start to build that. Now I have a question for you. How many UI libraries or framework would you use in a single page application? I see some one here and there. Fantastic answer. Perfect. Why do you want to use multiple of them on micro front ends? Because that's the part that I don't get it. So we are coding for our customers, performance mothers. So the playground uh, to test different technology definitely are not in production. So there are certain situations, though, where I see multi-framework having sense. Because remember, it's always a trade-off. For instance, if you're dealing with legacy systems, Usually, when a, mono, when a monolithic architecture, what you tend to do is saying, go to the business, I need 18 months, I rewrite from scratch everything, big band deployment, boom, it doesn't work. Sorry. And also, on top of that, you have the other problem uh, where the, you ask for a huge investment for, for the company without any guarantees. The reality is with, with Microphone 10, what you could do, we said that they are independent and they, uh, I can uh, deploy them uh, easily in, in, in production. And therefore, I can have a situation where I migrate a legacy system slowly but steadily towards Microphone 10. And if you're familiar with the, uh, a pattern that is a strangler pattern, and microservice is uh, uh, probably the most famous one when you are migrating a monolithic architecture, it's exactly the same thing that you can do. The same thing when you are migrating UI frameworks. Often I have, I've seen customers uh, that are stuck with Angular 1.5, for instance. And then they want to migrate to something new, but the, the system is too huge. And therefore, they need to have some help. And that's potentially another way why um, multi-framework approach might make sense. And last but not least, this one is a, a, a recent one that I, I discovered in the last year. There are quite a few customers that acquire new companies, different technology, completely different patterns, but they want to uh, have revenue from, from their investment, and they want to have everything under the same umbrella. So that's another reason why multi-framework approach might make sense, but remember, it's temporarily. So you don't optimize for that. You just have as a transition phase. So remember, if you optimize for that, you are bringing not only a technology choice, but also a community choice. The way how Angular, React, Vue, Solid, and all the others are designing their framework are different, are not exactly the same thing. And they're bringing the decisions that uh, you need to understand. And when you have decisions that clash together, then it's a problem. The next one is the Swiss Army Knife. So, um, or right programs that do one thing and do it well. I'm a big fan of uh, Unix programs. How many of you knows about them? Almost everyone, I guess. Uh, and as you know, they do one thing, but they are composable. Absolutely fantastic uh, uh, design principles. So let's think about this scenario. We have a Greenfield project. We identify that it's the perfect fit for microphone ends. Fantastic. So this one is a client-side rendering implementation. Uh, where usually for microphone tents, what you have is an application shell or a container that is loading one or multiple microphone tents. Then we have a domain that is owned by a team that is microphone tent A. And then we have another one that instead we have two domains. Imagine, I don't know, the user profile and payment. And then you need to display them both in the same page. So you have two teams that are working uh, together. So after the composition that you decide to go in client-side rendering and loading them, you need to understand how they're going to communicate. 
So in this case, let's assume that we decide to use custom events. After that, despite you have uh, a single micro front end loaded or multiple of them, both of them, they need to share a session. So maybe it could be, I don't know, local storage, or it could be any session storage, the JWT token available inside a cookie, up to you to decide what fits better. And that's what you have. Unfortunately, there is the legacy editor that could take eight months to be rebuilt. But the, com but the business wants that online with your new project. And what I have seen, not once, but at least six times, is uh, uh, this pattern. So they have the application shell, they have the legacy editor, so now the team responsible for the application shell start to create some APIs that are meant for the legacy editor. And then they need to ask some changes on the legacy editor, and if they are lucky, there is still someone that uh, maintains this legacy editor. And they ask, OK, so now we need to build all this stuff. And, and they pollute, basically, the application shell with code that in probably six months time, eight months time, one year, will be trashed. Because it's not useful. It's just for uh, temporary use of this legacy editor. But we have learned better patterns uh, for do dealing with this stuff. First one comes to my mind is the anti-corruption layer. The anti-corruption layer is a fantastic pattern that basically is trying to protect the inside world from the ex uh, outside world. And this is exactly what we are trying to do. So there is this legacy editor that has written with different technology wherever. And instead of polluting the, uh, the code of your application shell that works perfectly with the brand new application, why not wrapping the legacy editor inside uh, an anti-corruption layer and use the anti-corruption layer for sanitizing the communication between the application shell and the legacy editor? So in this case, you don't only win because your decisions, architectural decisions, are aligned on the rest of, of the uh, application, but also you're ready for the future. If tomorrow you decide to take these anti uh, to finalize this legacy editor, you have all micro front ends, and then you want to swap it for the application shell, doesn't matter because you already sanitize all the communication at an anti corruption layer level. So, what you need to do is remove an anti corruption layer and deploy the new micro front ends implementation, and suddenly only one team or the teams that are responsible for the legacy editor are, are uh, in charge of taking care about the, the changes. So the core team doesn't have to um, uh, risk a deployment that might cause, introduce new bugs in, uh, um, uh, in the rest of the application. So in this way, you really stabilize the code base of your um, application shell uh, and uh, uh, you make uh, ready for the future. So when you are, um, one good suggestion usually that I provide when, uh, when we talk about application shell is the fact that y it should be domain unaware. So if you think about cross-cutting uh, concern, try to think twice if they need to live inside uh, the um, application shell, because otherwise you risk to create design time coupling between the application shell and your micro front end. So now the deployment is always micro front end and application shell. That is basically an anti-pattern by itself. The next one I call a return ticket, please. And this one is the idea behind unidirectional data flow. So why that? Because there are some frameworks in the micro front ends uh, that has these, uh, uh, let's say, this application shell often is called also host. And then you have a micro front end that is, uh, uh, can, call, can be called also remote. And what usually you expect is that the remote is loaded inside the host, right? Because you have a container, and then I load my portion of the UI that is my micro front end. But certain frameworks allows you to do also bidirectional sharing. So I can have some stuff that are living in the container and I share with one, two, ten, do dozen micro front ends. Now, um, these can be called bidirectional. There are certain frameworks that call omnidirectional and, and so on and so forth. So the, why this is a bad practice? In 2015, 
Facebook came out with uh, something like that. How many of you remember the uh, good old and good flux? <laughs> Perfect. So a few of you. So the flux for me wasn't probably the best state management that were, was out there. But it had one characteristic that was really revolutionary, in my opinion. I work a lot in the past with uh, MVC, MVVM, MVP, MDI, and all the other, uh, sorry, DCI, and uh, all the other uh, M architectures. Uh, and, and one thing that was crystal and clear is that you always have bidirectional communication. Always. There wasn't unidirectional flow. And the unidirectional flow was the game changer, in my opinion, for simplifying the life of developers. Why that? Because now ha you have like four elements, action, dispatcher, store, view. But the flow was always in one way. Because they hide for, uh, at the framework level, the update of the view wh when was needed. Think about nowadays, vast majority of the frameworks are dealing with the, uh, reactive programming for updating the views and stuff like that. But for you, it's completely transparent. And the unidirectional data flow wasn't picked only by uh, Facebook in this one. Now, almost everyone is using this approach. But moreover, also the Android native um, development is embracing that with something that is called MVI, or Model View Intent. Model View Intent is not available only for, for Kotlin or, or for Java. It's also available for JavaScript. Um, and also, Elm is probably one of the best implementation that they've seen, but also Cycle.js, if you're familiar with that. The beauty of this approach is that it's using uh, um, reactive streams for communicating across different elements. So when there is an interaction from the user, it's passed into the stream, an intent to describe what the user is trying to do, send the, for the new state to the model, the model update uh, whatever it has to update, and, and co communicate through another reactive stream to the view, and suddenly we have the interface updated. That is uh, another uh, approach that simplifies drastically uh, the way how we are developing stuff. Why that? Because what we have learned since then is that it's easy to debug. It's not just, uh, let's say, easy to develop because some parts are handled uh, by the framework and the, the state management, but it's easy to debug. So I can understand that if there is a, a problem in the action that is dispatched or if the problem on the model, I know exactly where to look it. And then it's also less prone to errors. Because we, s we reduce the cognitive load, we know that these things uh, became uh, easier to manage uh, for, um, uh, for the developers. Therefore, unless it's strictly needed, try to avoid uh, the, the bidirectional sharing and try to keep uh, the unidirectional mindset also for sharing things. And always from the parent to the children, not the other way around. Because the way when you change something, you need to have strong boundaries that are not going to impact the rest of the application. Otherwise, you start to introduce uh, errors and bugs inside your system. The next one I call the relax is just code, or they avoid organizational coupling. Because uh, another spoiler, architecture, organization structure, and communication flow are bounded together. So when you think that you take just a, a design decision, oh, I pick just a monorepo because it's the way how to do things, it's not just that. You are also setting how your team are going to communicate together. It's way more complicated than that. So this one is another thing that I have seen dozens of times uh, when I do consultations. And uh, usually when you start with microfront tests, the first thing that is quite normal for front-end developers uh, to, to think about is, OK, so I'm used to, ro to work with uh, React and Redux. Uh, and now I create a nice Redux global state for all my microfront tests that all are dependent of. And I just decouple my UI. Because they treat the UI as a component, not as a microfront end. Now, this one is, if you're familiar with microservices, is more or less the same thing to have one database and multiple microservices that are dealing with the same database. That is, we know for sure that it, it provides some um, issues when we want to update and change the schema of the database or other things. Same thing here. Literally two weeks ago, I had a session with, with a company that is quite used to microfrontends, 
and they are migrating from this state to this state. What you really want when you have microphone tents, you want the state that is encapsulating inside the microphone tent, so it's independent. I can independently change and update my API. I want to use API first contract where I can define the way how my microphone tents are communicating. And in this case, I want to do in a loosely coupled fashion. How can I achieve that? Publish subscribe pattern. The publish subscribe pattern allows us to have a, a producer that is sending an event and the consumer doing something else. We have seen that several times. And the way to express in the front end world is either custom events, reactive streams, or event emitter. If you have an event emitter inside your page that allows you to communicate through events with other microphone end, then you are, you are forcing your teams to sit down and decide what they need to pass. They so sit down and define your API. That means that if I had another couple of microphone tents inside the same view, the effort for the new team is literally going to the documentation, checking the events and what is bubbling around, and plugging themselves into the system. How nice. So when you think about communication, it's very, very important that you maintain the independence nature of microphone tents, because what you want to have is teams that don't have or don't have external dependency, or they reduce that drastically. Otherwise, you are not in a great spot. The next one that I didn't uh, uh, thought, I didn't think to had to see, uh, but apparently it was uh, quite common, is when you have multiple microphone tents calling the same endpoint. So I did quite a few. Um, let's say, session where I have uh, like uh, teams that were telling me, Luca, listen, uh, we have this microphone tent implementation. We have implemented it this way. But then we have few microphone tents are calling exactly the same APIs. And how can we mitigate that? Can we cache the, the response? Can we create like a nice caching layer in between microphone tents that we can, we can use that? So I started to dig deeper because it definitely is not enough information. I need to understand deeply how they design that. And uh, what, what turns out to have is that we have these two microphone tents that are calling the same API. But on top, this company will, has a, a distributed system on the back end, so they were using microservice. So let's see what, what does it mean for that. So if I have an end-to-end -end distributed system, usually um, you, have, uh, a, you need a way for exposing your API. Quite common way is using API Gateway. Um, it's a pattern that is quite common on, on microservices. And then uh, many of the offerings that are available uh, out there, uh, when you request in an authenticated fashion uh, your APIs, they have an authorization service that is living uh, at the API gateway level. So you can control everything that is coming in. After that, everything is fine. So we have two requests on authorization service. And now we go to finally API 1. Unfortunately, we are talking about distributed systems. So it's likely that they have some other microservices to fetch data from. OK, so now we have four elements inside our distributed system on the back end that has to scale at two requests per second. OK, now if it's two, fine. Should we think about million or 10 millions, whatever? Those are the real challenges. Your front end might cause more arm, more mi your micro front end implementation could cause more arm than benefit in a situation like that because you are currently asking to the back-end counterpart to raise their, uh, let's say, number of TPS that they need to support. On top of that, obviously, the headroom that they need to support. And it might be more challenging than what you think. So possible solution for something like that. Usually, the first suggestion that I have is, shall we go to the whiteboard and try to understand if these two microphone tents are really two independent microphone tents? Or in reality, what you need to have is one microphone ten, and you just design in that way because you follow the Conway's law that it states that usually you design your system based on your organization structure, and you just apply, split this because it was like that in your previous system, and therefore you didn't even think of revisiting your teams. And sometimes this one is uh, uh, the, the right answer. 
Another one, although, uh, that I found on top of the first one is this one. So we said that the components are leaking the domain because the domain is, the is owned by the container. So let's create a micro front end that owns the, the domain, so it's calling one API, and then is through properties, is injecting those inside the component. It's kind of normal for front-end developer doing this, but often, uh, you know, because they are focusing on the on the component and not focusing on the business boundaries, they might risk to to uh, not get in there. So try always to understand the end-to-end -end impact of your decision, because often it's not just front-end. So the last one that I want to show you is probably the one that in the last year I have seen more often. And I call bye bye Big Bang or iterative deployment. The challenge that often people are stuck with is the migration strategy. So now I have my monolithic architecture and I need to migrate to my front ends. How can I do that? The complexity is that we don't have anymore just one artifact that contains JavaScript, uh, CSS, and all the other stuff. What we have is multiple teams that are deploying their, their um, micro front ends, the uh, independent uh, system, and they, you need to migrate from, from this monolithic to another one. And what I have seen so far is that the um, vast majority uh, of the time, the best way is starting from one portion of the, the uh, application. So you can use like a path like, for instance, catalog. And the catalog one is a microphone tent. So when you have one or multiple microphone tents ready for the catalog, you redirect the traffic towards this microphone tents part. And you rely on, on uh, all the rest of the, the, your routes into the monolithic implementation. Now, the question could be, how can we do that? How can we shift the traffic towards one place and another one? So it depends if you're doing server-side rendering or client-side rendering, but let's pick client-side rendering that probably is the most common one that I have seen. So usually, people start to do this routing and this redirection uh, on the client-side level. And this is a problem because you might risk that, especially at the beginning, when if you're not in the catalog and you load one or the other, you need to redirect on the other side, and therefore you ask the user to reload everything. The best way that I have seen this implementing is at the on the edge. And what does it mean is that you can, the vast majority of the services uh, CDN allows you to have a bit of compute on the edge. So when you have a request that is coming like, I don't know, slash catalog, instead of, uh, again, polluting the code of your application shell, what you can do is say, okay, I intercept this information, and then slash catalog has to load the microphone front end path, not the, the monolithic uh, uh, architecture. And in this way, you are just segregating the routing logic into, uh, at, at the edge. But there is more. When you start to have a situation where you have like home, catalog, and all the other microphone front ends ready, you can also think with this technique to implement some safe net for your developers. Because what we are creating, and it's quite important when we think about distributed system, is the investment around developer experience and uh, um, uh, the DevOps part. Because what we want, really, is that when I deploy a new independent entity, I want to see if it's working and how it's working. And vast majority of the compute on the edge allows you to retrieve information like user agent or where the user is, is uh, uh, requesting the page or stuff like that. So potentially what you can do is say, I now have OM that is a micro front end. I want to test it against uh, the, my um, previous system, so the monolithic one. What I want is that 5% of the traffic is going to the new micro front end only if the user is coming from Sweden. And maybe I can also say I want to, to that is coming from Sweden and is using Chrome. So in this case, you can at the edge, handling this shift of traffic more or less like you would do for microservices using Canary releases or blue-green deployment. Oh, sorry. Next, not previous. I um, designed this implementation uh, back in the days in 
2018, and then I deliver a talk about that. So if you're interested, there is uh, this talk available on YouTube where I explain in, in my previous company how we were doing that. And uh, AWS is one of the options, but there are more obviously uh, nowadays. Almost uh, all the um, CDNs are they have a bit of compute available uh, on, on the edge. And the beauty of this approach is that uh, I've seen something that I didn't expect. I bet. I wanted to achieve that, but I didn't expect it was immediately uh, used. When we started to move to this pattern here, we created this safe, safe net for developers. Developers started to uh, avoid rollbacks. They started to roll forward every time. And the cool thing is that we move from five, six deployment uh, of our monolithic code base per uh, month to 25 per microphone tens per day. Because we create now the developers, they start to, to add, they have the observability dashboard. They started to say, okay, so let me deploy my microphone tent, deploy very fast feedback loop there, and then they say, okay, I want five percent of the traffic in in, in this uh, microphone tent. They started to see if something was was okay. They start to ease more traffic and more traffic till they arrive to a certain point, and then they say, okay, there is a problem here because we have seen this customer having this problem. Okay, let's move back to 100% on the previous version, and then uh, we fix our stuff. And they started to have this feedback loop because everything was very fast, and we invest a lot of time on that. And this is the behavior that you really want to see because in distributed system, you need to verify that everything is working nicely. But if you want to maintain the speed of development, you need to create a safe net for your developers. So. Remember, when you are migrating into microphone tents, take one domain end to end, and then slowly but steadily slice your monolith into a new distributed system. That will not only create confidence for developers, but they add value for your users because you can start to add faster new functionality and um, potentially new revenue. I want to wrap up uh, with uh, one thing that in modern architecture is very true. So there isn't right or wrong in architecture. Very often I've heard discussion like, this is the only way to do things. Doesn't work. In architecture, there are trade-offs. And usually what the role of an architect or a developer that takes an architectural decision is to take the least worst decision, because there isn't a perfect one. And the way to take that is understanding your context. What is working for a company doesn't mean that it's going to work inside your company. So it's essential that you understand the constraint, you understand the environment, you take a step back, and remember that a decision that you make sometimes, um, uh, on, uh, at ideally on, on your microphone tent or microservice, might impact the rest of the company. If you want to know more about microphone tents, uh, this year I've wrote an article that I try to wrap uh, my thought in about uh, microphone tents and their future, and where I see gaps at the moment that I'm trying to fill with other activities. And uh, um, that's all I got. I hope that you enjoyed, and uh, enjoy the rest of the conference. And if you have any question for me, uh, you can ask here. You can, have, you can find me uh, outside. And also, if you want to email me, because tomorrow in a week time you have other ideas, feel free to do so. Thank you very much.